All right, go ahead. Great. Uh, so we have 45 minutes, so we should leave like probably around 10 minutes for for questions. Okay. Um, that's great. Uh, thanks for thanks for uh, joining us. So we're going to just be talking about um, some of the work that we've done um, that uh, is funded by CIHR and by Public Health Ontario and by the um, by the NML uh, to look at antibiotic resistance uh, in Ontario. Um, and so we're going to talk about four uh, specific projects. Um, Three that uh, are completed and one that uh, is still ongoing. We're just getting started on. Um, so we, we're going to talk about uh, uh, antibiotic susceptibility uh, levels of urine culture specimens in Ontario. Um, we're going to talk about the prevalence and mortality uh, of uh, different bloodstream pathogens. And then we're going to look at specifically E. coli bacteremia and uh, its association with um, uh, mortality of different uh, antibiotic resistance profiles. And then we're going to talk about something called uh, our clinical antibiotic resistance index, which is kind of a, a futuristic project of ours. Um, and along the way, we're really going to be looking at uh, demonstrating the, the value of population um, based data for AMR research and surveillance looking at uh, some of the key data sources and methods that make this work possible um, and some of the challenges we've had along the way. Um, so um, the, the pan-Canadian uh, framework uh, for tackling antibiotic uh, resistance and antimicrobial use has uh, four core strategies, surveillance, uh, infection prevention and control, stewardship, uh, research and innovation. Um, our, our work kind of um, touches on some of uh, each of these four, um, uh, I guess, strategies as well. Um, so Combat uh, AMR is a, a, a project, um, uh, is kind of our project uh, name that we've developed for the work that we're doing here in Ontario. Um, it stands for uh, Comprehensive Ontario Microbiology uh, laboratory Administrative Data for Antimicrobial Resistance. It's a bit of a contrived um, uh, acronym. And uh, the purpose of this project is to identify the incidence and prevalence of AMR, to measure the attributable uh, mortality associated with specific forms of AMR, and then to combine these into um, a resistance index to look at the total burden of um, resistance on, uh, on outcomes in Ontario. Uh, as I mentioned before, this is work funded by CHR, uh, Public Health Ontario, and uh, the National Microbiology Labs. So starting uh, talking about um, urine cultures um, in Ontario. It's work that was published in CMAJ Open. So uh, over 30% of antibiotic prescribing uh, in Ontario is for uh, presumptive um, UTIs. Uh, treatment of UTIs is often empiric and isn't necessarily based on local resistance. Um, the US IDSA and the European ESCMID uh, guidelines for uncomplicated UTI emphasize uh, how important it is to account for local resistance patterns. Um, so, um, so this was kind of one of the pieces that we want to begin to address in Ontario. Um, so uh, E. coli is the dominant uropathogen, and most uh, guides for empiric treatment uh, in Ontario uh, are based on um, uh, E. coli. Um, we wanted to examine, one of the pieces that we want to examine in this work is uh, differences between uh, an antibiogram um, and what is known as a WISCA, which is a weighted incidence syndromic combination antibiogram. Uh, the, the idea is really to kind of create a weighted average of uh, the antibiotic resistance profiles of all uh, urinary pathogens. So it'll large, it'll be dominated by E. coli, uh, but then Klebsiella and Proteus will come in, and um, uh, the, their resistance profiles would um, play a role in the antibiogram for um, urinary pathogens. Um, and so. So the specific objectives of this project were to measure the prevalence of antibiotic resistance, to compare outpatient, inpatient, and long-term care resistance profiles, and to look at uh, an E. coli antibiogram and how it compares to one of these weighted incidence antibiograms. 
the the data for this is based on IC, ICS data, um, uh, it, or it was conducted at ICS, uh, which is a research institute uh, that we are a part of uh, that has all of Ontario's uh, medical administrative data. Uh, and uh, the, the microbiology lab is being drawn from the Ontario lab information uh, system. Um, so this has culture and susceptibility data that, uh, that we cleaned. Uh, and we also uh, linked this um, culture and susceptibility data to uh, the registered person's database. Um, so that's a vital stats database and a discharge abstract database of Ontario's. Um, and so we were able to pull covariates that include age, sex, setting, health region. Um, um, so the point of this graph uh, is to say how uh, massive OLIS data is um, and, uh, and microbiology data within the OLIS data, even though it uh, shows up as the fourth bar in this uh, in this bar chart um, is still massive. It still has around 70 million unique results. And that was in 2015. And since then, uh, the data has only grown to be more complete uh, and have additional years. So we're talking about uh, really massive amounts of, uh, of data that come through. Um, these are uh, rec number, the numbers of unique records in the data set. So OLIS, uh, which is the Ontario Lab Information System data, has uh, three linked data tables, um, observations, test requests, and orders. Um, these are different ways of uh, identifying kind of nested um, uh, information. Um, and the data is, I would call it uh, semi-structured, um, and most of the tests are, most of the tests and test results are uh, identified with what are known as uh, LOINC codes. Um, a, a LOINC code uh, it stands for a logical observation identifier name and code. Um, and the, the results of these LOINC codes um, are generally free text for uh, culture and susceptibility information. Um, the, uh, so so it, what we started off doing for cleaning, uh, for cleaning this OLIS data, because we were involved, uh, or part of the reason that we kind of got the grant funding to do this work was to um, to actually be cleaning this OLIS data. So we first began by uh, identifying a, a list of LOINCs that identify cultures and a list of LOINCs that identify susceptibility results. And these will look like this. So you'll see that the culture test results will say bacteria identified from an aerobic culture, um, or in, in this second line, they'll say culture more generally. Uh, and then you'll see the susceptibility results will have the name of the specific antibiotic. Um, and um, the, the results of these, of the C-type results, will generally include an organism name um, if, uh, if it was a positive test or it'll say um, uh, um, no organism identified um, or nothing at all uh, if, um, if it was a negative test. And in the the la for, for the susceptibilities, um, these data were actually uh, quite a bit less complex. So the susceptibility results, um, the, the, just to give an idea of complexity, we kind of looked uh, when we first started doing this work at the ratio of the number of results to the number of unique values in those data sets. Um, and in the, in the susceptibility uh, sorry, in the culture results, one in every 70 yet records was unique. Um, that, to give you an idea of just how um, uh, complex the data were and how uncoded the data were. Um, on the other hand, um, in, in the susceptibility results, one out of 1,700 records were unique. So you can imagine why, because in general, the susceptibility results will say something along the lines of susceptible, intermediate, or resistant uh, with um, a, a large number of different uh, variations uh, on that. Um, and so we, uh, we uh, used a variety of tactics to uh, code these data. Um, we used uh, regular expressions, which is kind of uh, uh, a coding system or a, um, a way of working with free text, basically, to identify various spellings for the same uh, organisms and to encode organi organism names to their standard organism name. Um, 
and then uh, uh, and then we also uh, did the same thing for susceptibility tests. Um, we did a lot of uh, we did a lot of work just trying to reduce things that would remove uh, that would create unnecessary or uninformative uniqueness of of the field. So so we got rid of special characters, placeholders. We got rid of new numeric values or replaced numeric values with generic values, um, since in general they didn't uh, provide specific information that we needed to use uh, in our coding. All of that helped us uh, with with that project. And then, uh, so at this point, uh, we um, still had many um, specimens that were lacking some uh, susceptibility information. Uh, and that's because uh, different labs uh, tend to test and report um, susceptibility test results in different ways. Um, so we had a, um, a two-step process um, we Im to impute uh, missing susceptibility information. We would um, uh, we, we conducted rule-based impute, uh, imputation, so uh, this was for organisms that were intrinsically resistant to certain antibiotics. Um, and then we did a second step where we used uh, model-based imputation, um, and this was for, um, for um, susceptibilities that were still missing. And so we used uh, a full model when we had uh, did enough data to actually um, infer susceptibilities. So this was on a, um, this would have been on a organism by organism basis. We would uh, fit the full model. Um, uh, if it didn't uh, converge, we would then fit the patient characteristics only model. Uh, and then we would fall back to an intercept only model. And in each of those, this would give us a probability uh, that a an organism was uh, susceptible, um, uh, was non-susceptible. And we would then randomly draw um, uh, it, we would randomly impute um, so with a probability. So if it said it was a you know thirty percent chance that it was susceptible, uh, we would um, pick a random value uh, um, uh, of susceptible or resistant based on that uh, probability. So um, getting into the results of this uh, study now, um, we looked. Um, uh, we looked at uh, in Ontario over this two year period in 2016 17, there were 2.1 million urine culture orders and uh, almost 690,000 uh, unique cultures uh, that were included. Um, uh, and we found uh, that uh, susceptibility, uh, we found these susceptibility patterns um, overall uh, in outpatient settings. Um, um, you can see that. Um, uh, for most antibiotic susceptibility uh, was over 80 percent. Um, you can also see uh, the differences between uh, inpatient long-term care and outpatient, where on average susceptibilities were lowest in inpatients and highest in uh, outpatients. And then you can also see uh, 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 Differential divergence, I guess, between the uh, the WISCA results and the E. coli only results. So the green bars represent the uh, WISCA results, and the blue bars represent E. coli. Uh, sorry, the green bar represent E. coli, and the blue bars represent the um, the WISCA uh, results. And you'll see that in outpatients, WISCA and the E. coli based antibiograms were would were very similar. Whereas in the inpatient population, it's more important to include um, uh, the or, or to take account uh, take into account non E. coli pathogens because they're more prevalent, basically. So so the, there's that divergence that you see in uh, in the inpatient context. Um, on average, you'll see that uh, multi drug resistance. So we classified multi drug resistance as uh, resistance to uh, three or more of these. Uh, um, Drugs was highest in inpatient context uh, and uh, lowest in uh, outpatient context. And uh, as 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 always, the long term care was somewhere in between. So in outpatients, around uh, eighty to eighty five um, uh, percent of positive urine cultures were susceptible um, to to the um, six drugs we exam or to the uh, main treatment agents of nitrofurantoin. TMP, SMX, um, cephalexin, and uh, ciprofloxacin. Um, and WISCA, as compared to E. coli, had similar results in outpatients. 
um, but it, under, it seems to under, uh, the E. coli antibiogram underestimates uh, resistance in inpatient settings. Um, so um, this is really a kind of an example of harnessing population level susceptibility data uh, and tailoring it uh, to, um, to create uh, antibiograms for local uh, population, uh, or sorry, uh, this is actually kind of like a, a plan uh, now. We use these data at, at Public Health Ontario to provide um, a, a urinary antibiogram uh, to um, health regions and uh, facilities in Ontario. Uh, and so I'll pass um, uh, the slide deck control over to Nick now. I will stop sharing my screen if I can figure out how to do that. Stop sharing. And uh, Nick will um, uh, bring us through the, the second half of our presentation. Sounds good. Thanks, Kevin. Just trying to share here, and it's asked me to open system preferences. Anything I need to do for that? Uh, it should just, uh, if you click the share at the bottom of the screen, it should just give you the option to pick which screen you want to share. Instead, it's asking me to open uh, um, Are you on a Mac? Yeah. Yeah, there might have been a WebEx update. It does that to the students oh, okay. I work maybe, with all the time. You know what, for, for time, maybe I'll let Kevin keep sharing and I'll we'll do the slide advance thing. Unfortunately, sorry about that. Let's see if I can. Okay, here we go. Yeah, that might work better there then. Okay, thanks so much, Kevin, sir. Um, so I'll present uh, the second and third studies in our sequence. So as Kevin showed, we started by cleaning urine culture data because they are by far the most common bacterial cultures. And so just uh, this incredible uh, amount of data, but we moved from there to studying blood cultures. Um, the next most common and obviously represent a more severe spectrum of illness. In the next study, I'll come back to resistance uh, aspects, but first, we wanted to look at the prevalence and mortality of various bloodstream pathogens in Ontario. Bloodstream infections are common. They're among the top seven causes of death. And there are surveillance networks around the world that have been established to track BSIs, but they're really limited because they rely on these voluntarily participating hospitals, which are usually academic tertiary care hospitals. And so they underrepresent non-academic hospitals. They underrepresent BSIs in the community and long-term care as well. And also they usually, all they have is the bacteria and they're not linked to clinical data. So they don't have information on patient characteristics and outcomes. And they're also very labor intensive, um, requiring, you know, these bacterial isos to be shipped to some reference laboratory for standardized testing. But as Kevin said, now in Ontario, we have these cleaned OLIS data for population wide microbiology data. And we have them linked to ICS for these healthcare data sets to look at patient characteristics and outcomes. And so our objectives here were to quantify the prevalence of different bloodstream infection pathogens across all healthcare sectors, to look at the relative prevalence of these different individual organisms, and also the different odds of mortality associated with each organism to try and get a sense of the population health burden with different bloodstream pathogens. So we focused on calendar year 2017. That first study in urine cultures had looked at 2016, 2017. We started to feel like 2017 was the first year where we had very comprehensive data across the province. These are the same data sets that Kevin mentioned previously. And then we defined a blood culture episode as based on a seven day window. So if you had multiple positive sets um, within the seven day uh, period, those were all uh, arbitrarily defined as one episode. And we were a bit strict uh, for common contaminants like coagulase negative staphylococci uh, and that list you see there where we would require not just one, but two positive sets to get into this study. And, you know, we, we have tons of organisms, um, but for ease of display, we, we aggregated them up to the genus level, the exception being separating out staph aureus from the other coagulase negative staph and some of the streptococci species at a species level. We use the registered persons database uh, in Ontario to get the denominator of all Ontario residents, which was uh, above 13 million in that year. And then we did two different comparisons to see the adjusted risk of mortality with each bacteria. One, we compared them to matched other Ontarians. 
And the other way to do it was to compare to other patients who had undergone blood culture testing that was negative. And so they're not as common as urine cultures, but they are still very common. In that one year, there were more than 530,000 blood cultures that clustered into 253,000 blood culture episodes, of which nearly 23,000 were positive, about 9.1%, and provided the data for this study. So by, able, by linking to patient characteristics, we're able to look into subgroups and see what the uh, proportion are in terms of representing people that undergo testing in the left columns or the middle columns and those that have positive episodes on the right. I don't want to go through all the details, but you can see, for example, you know, a third of cultures are collected in the community, 34%, but only about 17% of positive cultures are collected in the community. Next slide. And then, you know, like I said, we, we can get to a very granular level. So this table could go on for pages and pages, but to be able to fit it in a manuscript in a presentation like this, we stop at the first uh, 70 or so species and aggregate them up to the genus level. And you can see here altogether, uh, bloodstream infections are very common, about 150 per 100,000 population per year. And like other surveillance studies, E. coli tops the list and Staph aureus comes out at, uh, at number two. And won't dwell on these for time, but we're able to, you know, graphically display, display the different prevalence or proportion of infections caused by different species by patient characteristics, like age shown here or on the next slide, um, sex, days of hospital exposure prior to culture collection, location, community acute care, ICU, non-ICU wards, for example. And because we link to outcome data sets, Without any, you know, cost to follow patients long term, it's you know routinely accruing data in these administrative data sets. We can look not just at hospital mortality, but 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, 365 days, and you can see some pretty, you know, scary stats like Staph aureus. 40% of people have died by one year after that uh, that infection. Next slide. And then, again, with these rich patient characteristics that are attachable, we can. Uh, look at the odds of mortality for these patients, and maybe just to animate in, can you drop the next arrow, Kim? We can compare them to patients without blood culture testing. Um, if you click, sorry, there's going to be some highlights. Oh, or, sorry. Uh, yeah, so there, if we compare to people that didn't have bloodstream infection, but looked like the patients in every other way, um, age, sex, comorbidities, et cetera, there's about a 2.6-fold increased risk of death when you have bloodstream infection. And then when we compare to negative cultures, there's about a 1.47 adjusted odds ratio of death uh, compared to people with negative cultures. And then if you just maybe advance five times, we'll see just some of the highlights. So, you know, it's very different by species. So Clostridium species, a seven-fold increased risk of death. Another standout is Canada, the one fungus that uh, makes it on the list of top pathogens, also has a very high odds ratio of death. Group A strep is a standout among the streptococci with a more than threefold increased risk of death. And Staph aureus is a standout, as you'll see again on the next slide. And on this slide, we wanted to really get at multiple dimensions. In fact, this is a four-dimensional graph. Um, so on the x-axis is the number of positive blood culture episodes for each organism. On the y-axis is the percent mortality within 30 days of a blood culture uh, with one of those organisms. The size of the bubble is the total number of deaths in the population in 30 days following one of these uh, organisms in the blood. And the color, which is the fourth dimension, would be the adjusted odds ratio for death compared to negative cultures from the previous slide. And so you can see, for example, E. coli on the right is very, very common, but doesn't have a very high odd, increased odds of death compared to negative cultures. Clostridium species, much less common, but a really high adjusted risk of death. And the one stand out in all dimensions is Staph aureus, which is common, um, lots of deaths, high case fatality rate, and a high adjusted odds ratio for death, even after accounting for patient characteristics. So to summarize this study, bloodstream infections are common. They have very high mortality rates against multiple comparators. The burden varies according to pathogen, and Staph aureus stands out as a high burden pathogen across multiple domains. And so as the next study, we wanted to take advantage of the linked susceptibility data to look at what is the 
risk of mortality with antimicrobial resistance. And we started with E. coli. Um, and in terms of background, I don't know if anybody uh, here saw this great publication in Lancet last year from the antimicrobial resistance collaborators. It's probably the most comprehensive global estimate of AMR mortality ever published. It was based on calendar year 2019 data, the estimated deaths and disability adjusted life years attributable to AMR, including 23 pathogens, 88 bug drug combinations, data from 204 countries, and 471 million individual records from microbiology. And they found that, and this is getting quoted a lot uh, these days, that there were about 5 million deaths associated with bacterial AMR each year, and 1.27 million deaths attributable to bacterial AMR in 2019. And E. coli was the number one uh, pathogen in terms of associated and AMR attributable deaths. But even though this was a massive, massive, massive study with 471 million isolates, like I said, when they did this work, they found that the weakest part of their estimates was that there was really not a lot of data out there to tell us what is the relative risk of death with a drug resistant compared to a drug sensitive infection. That part of their estimation was based on really scarce data, lots of assumptions. And that's because most regions have the micro data, but aren't able to link those micro results to patient characteristics and outcomes. And so we, sought to focus on the most common pathogen, E. coli, and examine the extent to which AMR is associated with an increased odds of death. And that's in the context of Ontario, which is a well-resourced healthcare system. So this is a retrospective study. We had now cleaned from 2017 to 2020. So uh, those four years, and we looked at all E. coli bacteremias. And we compared antimicrobial resistant versus susceptible E. coli. And we weren't interested in just one class. We looked at you know, the eight most common class of classes of agents that get used for a treatment. And we also added a ninth category, which we call difficult to treat resistance, borrowing that term from the literature as, you know, ones that are resistant to carpenems and fluoroquinolones, and at least one of ceftriaxone and piperacillin tazobactam. The challenge was much like what Kevin described in the urine culture work, that not all laboratories test and report the same panel of antibiotics. And even within a laboratory, reporting can be variably suppressed or released based on these cascades. And so that's a, a big front-loaded challenge of using routinely available microdata like this. And so we use the same imputation approach as that Kevin described, using rules, like if it's ampicillin sensitive, then it must be piperacillin tazobactam sensitive, or if it's ceftriaxone resistant, then it must be cephalazin resistant. And then you still have some missing results after that, but we can use models to impute those missing results based on what data we do have uh, for the other isolates that have those drugs reported. And so the resistance was our primary predictor of interest and our primary outcome was mortality at 90 days. And then we did this analysis. We looked at the unadjusted risk of death with resistant versus susceptible isolates. And then we did multivariable regression accounting for age, sex, where you were when you had the blood culture taken, the days you've been in hospital, ICU or long-term care in the previous year, how many times you'd seen a doctor in the previous year, whether you had a urinary tract or other sorts of bacteremia, and 18 individual comorbidities. And so in the study, we found 14,548 E. coli bloodstream infection episodes, most in hospitals, and about half uh, from urinary tract sources. And here are the resistance rates in Ontario. So one good news story is that you can't even make out the bars for carbapenem resistance and difficult to treat resistance, which occurred in only 0.2% and 0.1% of patients in Ontario. So that's good news. I mean, the bad news though, is that there's pretty substantial resistance out there already to some of our most common first line drugs, like third generation cephalosporins, piperacillin and tazobactam, uh, you know, 10 to 15% resistance. The reason there's four bars for each drug is that the bar, the far, the far rightmost bar for each one is our best imputation method, but even other imputation methods that we can try, like deleting all the missing results or making other assumptions about the missing results, we get very similar antibiotic resistance rates, which is uh, reassuring to us. And so here's the main result, looking at the odds of death if you have a bloodstream infection with resistant versus susceptible E. coli. In red, in blue, sorry, are the crude odds of death, and in red, after adjusting for all those patient characteristics. And you can see the crude estimates are really far to the right of one, meaning a really increased risk of death 
if you have resistant versus susceptible E. coli in your blood. After we adjust for patient characteristics, these effects are attenuated. Um, so they move to the left, but many of them are still significant. So even in a system like Ontario, where we don't have the highest resistance rates, uh, if you happen to have a bloodstream infection with a resistant E. coli, for example, for third generation cephalosporins or beta lactam, beta lactamase inhibitors, you can have you know, uh, a 30% increased risk of death already. So the discussion from this uh, in two quick slides would be that antimicrobial resistance surveillance can harness routinely available data from microbiology labs. The main challenge being that we don't get the same panel of antibiotics reported on all patients, but we can overcome this with uh, some imputation techniques. And that, next slide, sorry. I'm oh, sorry. That AMR has not yet progressed to the point in Ontario where we don't have effective treatment options. Resistance rates to those last line agents are very rare, but it is substantial for our most commonly used empiric agents. And AMR is associated with increased mortality, especially for those agents that commonly get used empirically. I do want to point out that adjustment for patient characteristics and prior healthcare utilization really attenuates that risk. So because most of the world, when they do these kind of studies, don't have the patient characteristics, they're really overestimating the current burden of antimicrobial resistance. But uh, nevertheless, even with proper adjustment, AMR is already associated with substantial mortality risk, even in Ontario. Okay, so I'll just speak very quickly to um, uh, some of the future work, and then Nick is going to uh, wrap up. Um, so, um, our our future work and what we're doing right now actually is trying to estimate uh, the public health impact of all forms of antibiotic uh, resistance in Ontario across all pathogens and resistant pro resistance profiles. Um, and so, for this work, uh, we're going to be looking at um, uh, 46 separate uh, uh, bacterial organisms, uh, 31 gram negatives and 15 gram positives. And we'll be looking at uh, in, uh, around 16 antibiotics for each bacteria. And so we'll end up with around 760 bacteria antibiotic pairs. And we're going to um, start off by measuring um, uh, the 30 day and 90 day mortality for each of those um, uh, or the relative risks uh, of um, 30 and 90 day mortality for each of those uh, bacteria antibiotic pairs. Um, but then uh, our, our plan will be to uh, create uh, the, uh, an index that measures the total impact of antibiotic resistance. Uh, and basically this will turn out to be a, um, a population attributable fraction or a weighted average of all the um, uh, uh, relative risks of infection um, across uh, each uh, organism uh, and um, antibiotic resistance profile pair. Uh, and we'll compare um, the, the resistance, the predicted incidence of mortality um, as if everyone had a susceptible infection compared to, you know, what we actually see uh, with the, the observed resistance profiles that we actually see. Uh, and that uh, that difference will be kind of the, the global impact of antibiotic resistance in Ontario. Um, so should, is it for me to, is that where I pick up? Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we just want to summarize that even though like there's so much work done for these active surveillance networks, we want to point out that there's millions and millions of routine microbiology testing results unharnessed in individual laboratory archives in Ontario, Saskatchewan, elsewhere. And amalgamating that data requires a lot of upfront work. So this has been a lot of work for us, but we feel like it's a uh, worthwhile effort upfront to, you know, because uh, this is a big global public health threat uh, that we're dealing with. And it, it'll be less work once we've gotten over that initial barrier. And centralized population-wide microbiology data linked to clinical data sets gives us, you know, comprehensive information on pathogens and resistance not limited to Sentinel voluntary hospitals, can span across all healthcare sectors. And it does offer, although we're not quite timely yet, it offers a potential for timely surveillance at facility levels, regional levels, provincial levels. And uh, we're hoping that Ontario can kind of be an epicenter for this with all this linkable data. But the nice part about that is you don't actually have to be in Ontario 
and working at ICS as a scientist to access this data, there's a data analytics services group uh, set up that people outside researchers can uh, go there and, uh, and access and use data sets. So hopefully this will make that data available across Canada and uh, internationally. And we just wanted to end up with acknowledgments to our, our Public Health Ontario colleagues that are uh, working on this combat AMR team, also some members outside of uh, Public Health Ontario and these amazing uh, analysts at ICS that are working so hard on this, what's really endless data cleaning. And we can hopefully stop there with some time for discussion. That was great, thank you. I'm just gonna stop recording here.